Uh, hi everyone, and welcome back to Introduction to English Literature. Uh, so this is the uh, lecture number four, 14, I guess, 14, um, Commonwealth and Restoration. Again, I always love uh, when I start my, uh, my videos to remind you of our progress. Remember we said that this course is uh, a literary course an introduction to literature. So it is concerned with literature, but also in its context. So we always refer to the word context. And this is why um, we are interested in the contextualization or the contextualized questions. Okay, so we are always interested in the context. So we study literature, we study texts, we study poetry, we study drama, we study everything about literature and fiction, but in its uh, always in their context, right? So far, we studied um, the old English literature. Remember the, the times of wars and invasions. And then uh, we studied the Middle English literature when the English identity started to, um, to develop. Remember with the, um, with the father of English literature, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer and all the other guys of course and then we spent so many um, lectures on the Renaissance and we said that even though we are done with the Renaissance but uh, it's never uh, completely uh, done because there's a lot to, to talk about and to say uh, regarding the Renaissance and I, as I told you you will study a completely separate course uh, for the Elizabethan literature. And then you will have another one um, for Shakespeare, just for Shakespeare. And you will come again for the Renaissance era in the poetry course. And of course, in the um, literary criticism uh, courses. And always here and there, uh, you will find references to the golden age of literature, to the Renaissance era. But last lecture, um, we said farewell, we said goodbye to, um, to the Renaissance. Uh, we studied so many things about the Renaissance, um, the playwrights like Shakespeare and Marlowe and Ben Johnson and um, all the guys and the poetry and um, um, uh, the metaphysical poets um, and the prose and everything. There's a lot uh, that we said about uh, the Renaissance. And I concluded um, saying that the politics will change. Now, we said so many things about the politics uh, in the Renaissance context. Remember King Henry VIII, who, because he wanted to divorce his wife, um, converted to, um, to Protestantism and made himself, converted the whole country, because if the king is... is is Catholic, the whole country is Catholic. If he converted to uh, Protestantism, it's still Christianity, but uh, another um, sect, uh, the whole country converts. And he executed so many people uh, due uh, to this decision. So many people who remained Catholic and um, been vocal about it um, have been um, uh, killed. Now, his daughter, uh, now his, his, his son, you remember, his son was so young and he died quickly. Uh, not that effective. But his sister, who is the daughter of King Kelly VIII, Mary, Bloody Mary, even her name, Bloody Mary. Now, they framing her because all of them were bloody, of course, not only her, but still she was bloody. She killed so many people because she went back to Catholicism. And then her sister, the famous Queen Elizabeth, who ruled uh, for a long era, uh, converted again to Protestantism, and then it, um, it stayed uh, in uh, uh, the Protestant church, the English church, until today. But only for a few years, it went back to Catholicism. But for a few years, and then back again to uh, Protestantism, and we will talk about this today. 
And then we also mentioned politics when we said that the Puritans, who are, yes, religious, but still a political uh, movement, closed the theaters. Because remember, theaters were, for them, a symbol of corruption. So we always came back to, to, to politics. Uh, and we so many times discussed the relationship between uh, politics and literature. Does politics affect literature? Or does literature affect and influence politics? Or is it a mutual influence? Do they both influence each other? Or are they separate things? No influence at all. Neither of them influence the other. So this is a question. Think about this. And these questions that I raise uh, do not have one answer. You know, it's more of an opinion question, an open question. Think about this. What do you think? In our situation, the Palestinians, uh, is our literature um, influenced by, by, by our um, uh, politics, by our reality? Uh, do we find the occupation? Do we find Hamas and Fatah? Do we find uh, the elections? Um, do we find them in the literature? Or is it about fairy tales? And does our literature, the songs we write, the slogans, the, the poetry, Mahmoud Darwish, Samih Al-Qasim, all the guys, do they affect us? Do they affect the, the, um, uh, the, the reality, the politics? Um, so everyone has their own personal experience and um, observations, and they can have their own answers. But anyway, keep this in mind. Always think about this the relationship between both of them. Uh, and let's move to our lecture today. Uh, the Commonwealth and the Restoration, two um, eras related to each other. First, we'll start with the historical context, as always. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, not in detail, just, you know, few glimpses, hints about the historical context of, of the era. Then we talk about the features of the age, because always we talk about the features. Remember, when we talked about the old English literature, we mentioned the features of that age. When we talked about the Middle English literature, we mentioned the features. When we talked about the Renaissance era, we talked about the features, and the, the metaphysicals had their features. The Shakespeare had his features, his own features, and always the features are important. And I, I'll say something about the features, because yes, the age could have like 10 features, 11. Not like, always like I can tell you that here are 10 features, and then you will watch a lecture from another university from Harvard, and you will find them uh, more or less or, or different. So it's not fixed, yani, you know? But they always are around one thing, okay? But when I say that the, the age, has those 10 features, again, I don't mean that every text has all these features. So when I tell you to contextualize, to comment on, on a particular text, one poem, one play, one, one, one text from the age, don't tell me all the features, just those who are found in the text. So if I give you 10 features for the age, remember them, but always when I ask you to contextualize one text, like, bring me the three features that you can find in this particular text. I hope this is clear for everyone. And then we will discuss some texts and see the features in those texts. Uh, three texts, actually, for two poets. And then, lastly, we will comment uh, on, on the same idea. The relationship between reality and fiction. Between poetry and politics. Okay? So, let's start with history. With, with some history. Um... So, spoiler alert, um, England, who had a king now for like a thousand years, for a thousand and five hundred years, now all of a sudden doesn't have a king. Now, England is kingless. <laughs> uh, and, and not only that England does, no longer has a king, but the king was executed, you know, executed, beheaded, killed. He was he was executed the king of England. Can you can you um, imagine this? In sixty and sixteen four in the sixteen forties, the Puritans remember the Puritans who were called the Roundheads. 
um, in in one side, and then we had the cavaliers who are uh, the side of the king. They went to a war against each other. And what do we call uh, this war when it's between two um, uh, sides from the same society, from the same country? We call this a civil war. Harb ahli, civil. We, we we talked about civil wars before, right? Um, in, in the first lectures when we talked about the the Middle Ages and the War of the Roses and uh, the One Hundred uh, Year War. So uh, there was a civil war between the Puritans and the Cavaliers, between the, the Puritans, the Roundheads, and the King's followers, those who defended the monarchy. Okay? A civil war. And who won this war? Uh, the Roundheads, the Puritans. And they did not. They, they did not only win the war, but they only they also executed uh, the king, King Charles I, in sixteen forty nine. All of a sudden, England had no king. Now remember, because we always talk about the relationship between literature and politics. Remember in Hamlet, so many of you, and I like this. I really proud of you. So many of you watched Hamlet or read Hamlet or read about Hamlet at least. And um, Macbeth, and in a way, King Lear. Remember in Hamlet and also in Macbeth, the king dies. Not only dies, the king is killed. Remember in Hamlet, um, um, the king is killed by his brother, who became the new king. And then the king is killed again by his uh, nephew, uh, the, the son of the, the first king, Hamlet. Right, remember? So the king is killed twice in, in, in the play. And in Macbeth, also the king is killed. And in King Lear, in a way, uh, he's thrown away. So, but in reality, it, it never happened so far. The king was never killed before in reality, in real life. Only in literature. But then literature was brought to life. Literature became reality. What was only in the minds, in the imagination, became part of the reality. And just the same, like when Hamlet, the king, uh, Hamlet the father was killed, everything went upside down. Ghosts started to appear. Um, uh, uh, a war inside the family um, uh, was raged. And like in Macbeth, when the king was killed, everything also went upside down. And a, a series of, of, of killings uh, started to happen. Also in reality, when the king was killed, everything also went upside down. Everything was confused again. See, what happened, what started in literature, all of a sudden became a reality. Uh, this reminds us of so many novels and, and um, poems and, and works that were fictional, completely fictional, and then all of a sudden they became reality. Sorry. Some inventions in the sci-fi movies, you know, the sci-fi, the science fiction movies and novels, some of them became realities. And some dystopian um, novels, like 1948, uh, who talked about a world of total, totalitarianism and dictatorship and um, where everything is controlled. And it, 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 in a way, it happened. So fiction becomes reality, you know? Uh, and this happened in, in England. The king was executed, and now we have the Commonwealth. Now, these days, the Commonwealth, um, uh, we call um, the, the countries that were controlled by Great Britain, we call them the Commonwealth, uh, you know. But back then, the Commonwealth was um, the, the, uh, the period that followed the execution of the king, uh, King Charles I. And who was the leader um, uh, of, of, of the Commonwealth? Oliver Cromwell. Now, Oliver Cromwell is a very important figure. Remember his name, 
Oliver Cromwell. See, I even bolded the, the name Oliver Cromwell. Um, he was the leader of the Commonwealth. Now, there is a lot to say about the Commonwealth. You can read about it. I won't um, spend so much more time here because we already spent a lot. But I want to, to comment on one thing here. See, Oliver Cromwell was the leader of the Commonwealth and he was a, a, a very strong leader. We will see now how poets praised him. He was a, a very successful leader and a very strong leader. But then he was followed by his son. After he died, he did not last long. By the way, he died yani, fast. Uh, he died quickly. And he was followed by his son. Now, you didn't like the king. You executed the king. And now there is no king in England. Uh, England was ruled by the, by, by the Commonwealth, like some, some kind of a, of a government. And then uh, you're succeeded by your son. How is this different from monarchy? How is this different from the king? Now, because there's a lot to say about the kings, but the most important criticism for monarchy, for uh, the royal um, uh, uh, families, is that a person, a prince, is born a prince, is born with the right to control me. I don't pick, I don't get to choose my leader, my president. No, he's born my leader. Huh? Right? This is one of the most important. And every other uh, bad thing you can say about monarchy is connected to this one thing. So how is this different, uh, Mr. Cromwell? Oliver Cromwell, when he dies, uh, he's succeeded by his son. You know, succeeded? Succeed means, you know, succeed to win, to achieve things. Succeed, but also succeeded, you know, to come after the, the president who dies or the, the president uh, who is no longer a president. The, the one after him succeeds him or the king, the one after him uh, succeeds him. Okay. So uh, I just want you to think about this because this happens a lot. Uh, a revolution to right the wrongs, to correct the situations, then the new people who are meant to correct the problems, to, to, uh, to right the wrongs, also commit uh, the same mistakes. You know, he committed the same mistake as the king. And this is the commonwealth. And then, just uh, shortly after, in 1660, the monarchy was restored. Just in 1660. So see how many how many years? It's 1649 to 1660, almost 10 or 11 years. That's it. This is the whole Commonwealth. The monarchy was restored. And this is why it's called the Restoration. Now, King Charles I was executed, and King Charles II, his heir, was sent to France. Now, in 1660, they brought him back. They restored King Charles II from France as the leader. How did this happen? No civil war, nothing. When his son was, uh, you know, he died, uh, Oliver Cromwell, his son was not as strong as him, and this is normal. Now, only because you're the son of, of a good leader, it doesn't mean yeah, you're going to be a good leader. No, Aslan, the opposite um, has the biggest chance to happen you probably will be a terrible leader because it's not something, a skill or an achievement that you, uh, uh, that you did that made you the leader. It's only because you were born to the leader, um, the son of the leader. And this is why you definitely will be, you will suck, you will definitely be, uh, be someone bad. Uh, and we can say this about us, right? You know, uh, the leader, or the minister, or the, um, the whatever is a leader, and all his sons and daughters, and all of them are leaders in a way or another, but not because they're good, not because they're strong, but only because they were born to, um, to a leader. Okay, anyway, we don't want to talk about politics here. We don't want to get in trouble. But because he was weak, the parliament, remember, now we have a parliament, a strong parliament, and, and maybe there was a parliament before, but now we have a strong parliament in, in England. They 
uh, said to the, to the son of, of Oliver Cromwell, okay, thank you, uh, good luck, bye bye. And they went back to France and they brought King Charles the Second. And now again we have a king. We are used to have a king. You know, it doesn't feel right that England doesn't have a king. But even though he was restored, he, he came back to England, the power was held by the parliament. He's no longer as strong as the previous kings. Remember King Henry VIII, remember Queen Elizabeth, remember Mary, remember King James. But now, from now on, kings of England are not that important. Now, they have a symbolic importance, but they are not that important. Uh, and this is uh, the situation till this very day. Now, you know, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, now the Queen of England, uh, now she's she has a symbolic importance, but she doesn't have any real power. The power is for the parliament and the prime minister. The prime minister is the most important political figure in, in the country. Now, uh, we have King James II. Remember King James I, the one, um, uh, the Jacobian, the one who uh, translated the Bible and everything. Now we have James II. This guy, this king, <laughs> uh, I didn't know what went wrong with his mind. He decided all of a sudden to convert to Catholicism again. Remember now. England has been a Protestant for so long and now he's all of a sudden a Catholic. And remember, when a king is, 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 a, is a Catholic, all the country has to become Catholic. So what happened? Remember, now we have a strong parliament now. They went to him, to King James II, and told him, okay, thank you and goodbye. Because remember, they went to a civil war just a uh, few years before this, uh, like perhaps 20 or, or 30, uh, 30 years or 40 years before this. And they've seen how horrible the war is, how difficult it is. And they decided that they don't want wars anymore. So when he uh, converted to Catholicism, they knew that this would rage an, a new war. We have the, um, you know, the Puritans, they are Protestants. Uh, and and they won't just like you know close their eyes. So what did the parliament do? They did. Um, they they said again, thank you, goodbye. His reign ended. They kicked him out, and then uh, his heir became the king. And this is why it's called the bloodless revolution. It's a revolution, but it is bloodless without blood without a war and it's also called the glorious revolution you know the bloodless revolution uh, a revolution without blood in 1688 and since then by the way england has never been um has never experienced a, a, a civil war um, a real one with with you know blood and, and everything unlike the rest of europe um England uh, quitted wars um, or quit wars uh, really early in, in its history. They've learned the lesson that war uh, makes no good. War is always bad. So they stopped making wars inside England and they started making wars outside England. They started occupying the rest of the world. Or maybe because they were busy you know, making wars and raging wars here and there in the world, you know, in India and in, in Egypt and Palestine and Syria and here and there, um, you know, they were busy uh, and, and in, 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 uh, in Ireland and in Europe and in America and in Australia and in Canada, you know, they, like, they occupied half of the, the globe. <laughs> so maybe they were busy making wars outside of England so they did not make any more wars in, inside England. And this is the restoration, okay? So this is a, a, a quick, uh, fast glimpse. You can always read or watch documentaries. 
uh, about the Commonwealth and the restoration. There's a lot more to read and to know, but this is uh, the most important um, uh, thing about um, the, 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 the age uh, that makes us understand the literature uh, of it better. Now let's see the features of the age. Now, the first thing, the people of England, the parliament, the leaders of England, um, they, they came to a realization that they should avoid revolutions. You know, they should avoid civil wars. They should avoid blood. This is one of the, the most important features. They no longer want uh, revolutions and, you know, blood and wars. And, and this is why it became uh, more of a reason age, a reason era, a, a, an era of, of reasoning, you know, of logic. Unlike uh, the Renaissance age. Now, the Renaissance age was more of exploring, you know, the explorations. They went to explore the world and the, the, the new worlds, you know. So it was uh, a, a, an era, the Renaissance era, of exploring what is new, of, 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 um, of trying, of experiencing. But now, you know, after the Civil War, after all the drama that happened, now they, they started to think more before doing things. So this is why reason was the spirit of the restoration. One of the most important things that we will talk about uh, now and always is the middle classes. Now, from now on, we will always talk about the role of the middle classes. You know, we have the, the poor classes, the low classes, the poor. And we have the rich. The, the noble families, the um, those who are above, and we have in between started a new class started to to appear, the middle classes, the middle classes. Um, we'll talk more about this later, not now, uh, but we will have to know how the middle classes uh, had more influence now. Okay. And the whole age was a time of commercial growth and scientific advances because, you know, now they want to, to focus on the real things. Now, enough with the wars, enough with the, the, the political fights, and let's now focus on uh, actual growth, commercial growth, you know, the commerce, the trade, and the scientific advances, uh, advances and everything. Okay, and then the parliaments of uh, Scotland and England uh, united became a one uh, parliament um, in, in both of them. And then we have Ireland, you know, now um, I've told you this before. We have England, England, and we have Scotland and we have Ireland and they make not the whole Ireland because, um, you know, Ireland is two, is, is two countries. Uh, they make uh, Britain. And then um, they all make the, the United Kingdom. It's it's a little bit um, uh, complicated. Uh, also, we have Wales. Um, what we have Wales, Scotland, England. Uh, this is Britain, Wales, um, and Scotland and England. This is Britain. And with Ireland, we have uh, the UK, uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, there is the, the British Isles. And oh, it's a lot. It's a lot complicated anyway now in, in scotland and england they were in a way um good okay the relationship was good and the parliaments united but your book says you know this is page uh what page this is page um this is page 56 page 56 you know page 56 the middle of the page uh, it, it, it reads, uh, the United Kingdom was finally united when the union of the parliaments of England and Scotland took place in, in 1707, but Ireland was still a problem. Okay? Ireland was still a why is Why was it still a problem? Because uh, they forced Ireland to become Protest, a Protestant. But the population, the people uh, of Ireland, the Irish people, stayed Catholic. Okay? They forced the whole country 
to become Protestant, but the people, their faith, stayed as it was, Catholic. And this is why Ireland became a problem, or remained the problem. And this is again, is as you guessed, this is whitewashing. Now, who is the problem here? Is it England or Ireland? Now, I, the Irish people in Ireland, they were Catholic. Okay? Now, here we are Catholic. England becomes to us, makes us uh, Protestant, even though we are Catholic. And then England is surprised that we are still Catholic and thinks that this is uh, th this makes us the problem. This is whitewashing. This is not what happens. You occupied Ireland, you know, and then uh, the people resisted. And by the way, till this very day, half of Ireland is still um, uh, still has problems to this very day uh, with England, with the United Kingdom. Okay. Because, again, Ireland is not one country now, it's two countries. And this happens with us, the Palestinians. It's always us, in the Western media, it's always us uh, who are the problem. We are the problem. The Palestinians, Gaza, Hamas, um, uh, the PA, um, the PLO, uh, the, um, the PFLP, Jabha, okay? We are the problem. Why? Because when they killed us, we refused to be uh, murdered in silence. Uh, we, we fought back. We resisted. This makes us a problem. The same logic. You went to Ireland. I don't want to, to, to give this more time, but the same logic, the same problem. Um, imperialism, guys, and um, colonialism has the same mentality. Uh, and this is why we, the Palestinians, who struggle with the Israeli occupation, and the, which is uh, um, uh, which which happened uh, thanks to the British imperialism, colonialism, uh, the British occupation, the English occupation of Palestine, we should always be aware of the other struggles around the world because it's it's one struggle. It's always one struggle. Yes, each struggle has its own. Uh, features and own problems and own context, but at the end of the day, imperialism and colonialism is one thing. It's always connected uh, together. All the struggles are connected. All the struggles are one struggle against colonialism. Uh, sorry for taking so long uh, on this part. Let's now go to literature. Let's now go to texts. Enough with the history. Enough with the talk. Let's uh, go to uh, the magic to the texts, to literature. Now again and again and again, we are more interested in literature, but it's always important to know the context in order to understand the text, okay? Now we will go back to Marvel. Remember Marvel? Remember this guy, Andrew Marvel uh, with double L? Uh, we talked about him before uh, with the um, um, metaphysical poetry. Now Marvel, he was a poet, but also a politician. He was a, a, a member of the parliament, an MP, MP, you know, a member of the parliament uh, in England. So he was both uh, an author, a poet, and a politician, a politician. He was a member of the parliament. And he was in the side of, as you can guess, of uh, Oliver Cromwell. Not the king, against the king, against the monarchy. And this is a poem praising, you know, the, the name of the poem, an oration odd uh, upon Cromwell's return from uh, Ireland. So Cromwell was in Ireland and now he's coming. So. I know it's it's a long um, uh, a long title to remember. Only focus on upon Cromwell's return. Okay, you can um, consider this the title of, of the poem. You know, uh, and now he's talking. He is um, describing Cromwell. So restless, Cromwell could not cease in the inglorious arts of peace. 
But through adventurous war, urged his active star. And then, you know, now we have ellipsis. Remember the three dots, the three here. So something is, is deleted. And then he goes, what field of all the civil war where his, uh, where not the deepest scar? Okay. I guess it's woes and scars. Uh, yes, it's woes and scars, not war and scar. Let me... Let me uh, do this because it's very important. Okay, wars. Okay, yeah. Arabic wars and uh, scars. Very important. Okay, uh, it's in your book, page uh, fifty-six. Now, what is he saying? Now, before, لما كنا لسه من دادي, the first when we first studied uh, poetry, we always started with the you know remember the rhyme scheme, but now we are good. Yeah, right. We know the rhyme scheme, and we can, uh, by ourselves, may, 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 like notice the rhyme scheme. So when I don't mention the rhyme scheme, it doesn't mean that it doesn't. It's not important. It is important. Can we make the rhyme scheme here? C S P S A A War Star B B, and words scars C C in a way, right? Not perfectly rhyming, but words and scars are uh, an imperfect rhyme scheme. So A A B B C C. You know, couplets, couplets. Cease, peace, war, star, war, scars. Okay, why is there cup? Why are there couplets here? Maybe he's um, implying something about the harmony uh, that Cromwell brings because he's now see, is he still, see the poem so restless. You know, restless. He doesn't rest. He doesn't sleep. He's always working. So restless, Cromwell. Cromwell. Oh no, the Cromwell, the guy, uh, could not cease. So he's great in the inglorious arts of peace. He's great in, in diplomacy, in negotiation, in peace, and also in war. But through adventurous war, uh, urged by his active star. So he's great in diplomacy, in peace, in, 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 in negotiation, and he's also great in, in war. And this is a great leader, right? A great leader that can be good at war, uh, courageous. But also, uh, good at diplomacy that can uh, uh, make adv take advantage of his uh, uh, his achievements in the field, in the war, right? Now, this is Marvel praising Cromwell. Now, is this literature? Some people would say, no, this is not literary. This is just a, politic, a political speech. This is not poetry, at least not poetry. Now, because it has music and it rhymes, doesn't make it poetry. Some people would say, no, poetry should be about feelings. Where are the feelings? No, this is a political statement. Others would say, no, this is a political poem. A political uh, poem. And it is. It is a political text, a political poem. But because, again, for some people, it's not only about the, uh, the rhyme scheme and about the, the music. It's about um, the metaphors, about the, the feelings. This is what makes a poem a poem, even if it doesn't have a rhyme scheme. Still, uh, when it, ha it has the metaphor, it's, um, a, a, it could be a beautiful, a very beautiful and touching uh, poem. But then, again, this is Marvel uh, praising Cromwell, and this is familiar. With us. But let's notice something, and this is one of the features. You can write this, you can add this one. This is some uh, or part of the feature uh, of, of, the, of the age. Now, remember before this, in, in the time of Chaucer, and Shakespeare, and remember the Fairy Queen, you know, remember the Thames, the, the river? Everyone was talking about the English identity, you know? They, they were proud of their Englishness, of what makes them English. They were always looking for their identity, uh, their national identity as English people. They were always praising their country. But now, see, he's not praising the country. He's not praising England. He's not praising, uh, he's not proud of being English. He's praising Cromwell. He's praising his, his in a way, his political party. Because before it was England, but now it's two parties competing. We have the roundheads and we have the cavaliers. 
and he's taking the side of Cromwell. Right? He's taking the side of uh, the Commonwealth. And this is why it's no longer about England. Political um, poetry, political literature is taking sides. And don't you find this familiar? Because back in the 50s and in the, in the 60s and before this, the Palestinian literature, the Palestinian poetry was all about Palestine, right? It was all about Palestine and, you know, uh, resisting the occupation, you know, Mahmoud Darwish, Samih al Qasim, um, uh, Azdil Manasr, Allah Yarhamum, and uh, just he died few, few, just like um, this week. Uh, may he rest in peace, uh, one of the most important um, resistant poetry figures. Um, whom I, I deeply uh, respect and like, uh, Allah Yerhamu. So you know these guys, these great guys, they always wrote about Palestine. Their poetry was dedicated to Palestine. But with the political division and the, all the political uh, situation, we find now this less and less in our literature. And even we don't have enough good enough uh, literature. Right, and this exactly what's happened in. Uh, see how everything is connected: the past with the present, the literature with the reality, the history with the fiction. Everything is in a way uh, connected. At least this is how I see it. Um, now, this is Marvel. Now let's go to Loveless. Remember Loveless? Uh, I asked you to translate his very famous and very. Uh, catching and beautiful uh, line uh, stone walls uh, do not a prison make nor bar nor iron bars a cage remember uh, now loveless wrote another uh, poem uh, and now loveless again as, as we said was not un unlike marvel he was a cavalier he was one of the followers of the king uh, to look Lucasta going to the wars. So he's writing to Lucasta. Who's Lucasta now? We will see. Going to the wars. This first stanza is in your book. The rest is not from the book, but we just, um, because we don't have uh, much time, we'll just focus on the first stanza. Tell me not sweet, I am unkind, that from the nunnery of thy chaste breast and quiet mind to war and arms I fly. Can we do the rhyme scheme? A, B, A, B. Right, unkind mind. A A nunnery and the fly. They have B B, but imperfect rhyme. You know why? Now we can we can think about why. Now to whom is he talking? It's clear he's talking to sweet, habibti, hulwati, sweet, to his girlfriend or to his lover, right? To his wife maybe, to his um, to to his mistress. Tell me not sweet. I am unkind. That from the nunnery of thy, you know, chaste, uh, in a way, virgin or, you know, uh, chaste breast and quiet mind, you know, he's, he's describing her physical appearance, chaste breast, but also her mind, her quiet mind. So, you know, it's no longer like, come live with me, eh? come live with me and be my love, or like Shakespeare, not only her um, physical um uh, appearance and physical feature but also her mind is important for him this is a change in the in the literature women are now not only do they exist but also they exist as um smart but people would say no quiet mind doesn't mean smart quiet mind means not annoying and still he's not praising her he's saying that she has a quiet mind so you know it depends on how you read the text so he's, he's telling her to war and arms, I fly. Don't tell me that I am unkind, that I should stay here, that uh, I don't think of you when I go to wars. No, to war and arms, not I'm going, not I am walking, not I'm running. No, I'm flying. To war and arms, I fly. So he's courageous, right? He's brave. He's flying to war and arms. Um. And see the nunnery, the word nunnery, and you know what's a nunnery, you know, where nuns live. Um, nunnery and the fly, they are kind of rhyming in a way, but imperfectly. Why? 
what does this the break of the harmony here the, the break of the symmetry what what does it tell us does it tell us that maybe he's not serious about flying to the war maybe he's not that brave maybe he's reluctant I'm not sure think about this the reason of of of, of uh, this imperfect try but now I want you to focus on the word arms here because remember the word pun we already talked about this I, I no longer uh, I, I, uh, you're taking notes okay when we started uh, the semester I always wrote everything for you but now you're familiar with all the, the things that I'm saying so um, I recon that you're taking notes now the word arms is a pun here now, because arms could mean weapons you know arms you know uh, when we say that this is an armed faction فصيل مسلح because it has arms you know arms weapons أسلحة but also arms are the arms you know our arms so to war and arms I fly it could mean it could mean to, to war and uh, weapons I fly or it could mean to war and to hug you to your arms I fly so this is a pun both meanings are possible both meanings are and this is why we call it um, a pun and again this is a political uh, poem we see even when it's about love now this this has feelings has has the love he's talking to his uh, to his mistress and everything but even with this uh, you know we have uh, politics and this is uh, again um, an example of, of how politics became uh, part of, of, of poetry an important uh, part of, of poetry and how the personal you know the love his, his personal life is connected uh, is linked to the to the public to to the political uh, and this is, uh, by the way, is part of our uh, literature, the Palestinians. It's always connected. Uh, whenever you talk about uh, our personal lives, it's always connected, always, always um, connected to literature. Uh, now, uh, this is the last uh, text today, uh, also from Andrew Marvel. It's called The Guardian. Now remember, Marvel was a follower of, or, or, or um, um, he followed or supported uh, Cromwell. But again, Cromwell died, and his son was not as strong, and then his son um, was kicked out, and then the monarchy was restored. And he was the enemy of the monarchy. So now he's in trouble, right? He did not go to prison, I guess, but he was about to go to, 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 to be put in prison. But he was a, a member of the parliament, so he did not go to prison, actually. But his friend went to prison. But anyway, because now they were defeated in a way, and the monarchy um, came back and everything, he decided to quit uh, the political uh, work. He decided to quit not only the politics, but also the whole city. And he went to the countryside. And he wrote a number of, um, in a way, romantic, we talk about romanticism, uh, a number of romantic um, texts. Uh, one of them, uh, this beautiful uh, poem, The Garden. It goes, very quiet, have I, fa I, have I found thee here. Remember thee means you. Very quiet, have I found thee here. And innocence, thy sister dear. So, uh, quiet, he's talking to quiet. This is um, a personification. Remember personification? It's also persona. He's talking to quiet. And this is persona and personification because a quiet won't reply to him. You know, quiet, quiet is, is you know, no, a feeling, a state of mind. It's not a person or not even a thing. Very quiet. Have I found thee here? Did I find you here? Quiet. And innocence. Thy sister dear. So he found, uh, you know, quiet the state, this state of mind where he's quiet and innocent. Mistaken long, I sought you then in busy companies of men. So I was mistaken. So now he's admitting that he was wrong. 
you know unlike remember uh the king uh who went let us for god's sake let us sit up on the ground and tell such stories of the death of king you have missed you but mistook me but now no mistaking long i thought and this is in grammar means i was mistaken for long and now i uh, when i thought you uh, then in busy uh companies of men not only i was mistaken for looking for innocence and the quietness in in the in the city but not only the city the place it's not the problem is not with the city the place but with whom is in the city with the companies of men society is all but rude society also again is is the city is comparing the city with the countryside society is all but rude to this delicious solitude oh very beautiful uh, you know delicious yummy delicious this is a uh, delicious coffee And solitude again means loneliness. In a way, not not exactly loneliness. That's the difference between solitude and loneliness. Solitude, loneliness is something sad, but solitude is is more of you know al uzla, something good. Yeah, you want solitude sometimes. So he's comparing um, the 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 city with um, uh, with the country, with the life of the countryside. Okay, so this is uh, Andrew Marvel um, again. Uh, you know um that's it uh the, the very important the most important things now quickly we'll talk about the relationship between uh poetry and politics we said that uh, uh the political uh, side became very important very crucial uh, during the commonwealth and the restoration we saw this in in the texts remember in in marvel and in loveless and uh in in, in loveless we also uh, saw how he contrasts and links the personal and the public uh, life when he writes about having to leave uh, his 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 mistress, his lover, uh, and go to war. Um, we we saw how Andrew Marvel appraises the strength of uh, of Cromwell. And by the way, again, Marvel was uh, the uh, the poet uh, laureate, you know, uh, the prince of poets, but not officially, the unofficial uh, poet laureate uh, to Cromwell, because he praised him, he wrote several poems during the Commonwealth. So he was, in a way, شاعر الحكومة يعني, طريقة أو يخرب, you know, شاعر بلاط, but not بلاط, because he's not a king, Cromwell was not a king, he was the leader kind of a prime minister or, or something. Um, and then we saw how in, in later in his life, he contrasted uh, politics uh, that is represented in the, in the city life with uh, or versus the quiet life in the country. And how he praised uh, the, the life of the country, you know, the country, the countryside, I mean a reef, a reef, countryside. He praised it and um, said how he was mistaken for 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 seeking uh, politics and um, how corrupt it is uh, and we talked about this uh, how now they were more reasoning uh, thing more more going to logic than to exploration uh, like the, the the renaissance that's it for today a uh, very interesting lecture uh, very interesting uh, very interesting information about uh, the history of england but also the literature uh, of england now for the discussion i want you to pick one of these texts and contextualize it because so many of you asked me about the contextualization and i don't know why but i always keep telling you how to contextualize things for example Pick one of today, we, we studied three texts, pick one of them and contextualize it. For example, I want to contextualize these uh, six lines from the garden. I first, I don't have in the exam, you won't have the name, the title and the, the poet. You just will have, you don't have to memorize the, the text, but you have when you, when you read it, you have to remember uh, who's the writer, who's the poet and what's the title, okay? So you, you tell me, this is, um, these lines are from the garden by Andrew Marvel. Okay, um, uh, it was written during uh, the Restoration Era. Okay, um, 
and then uh, you start, uh, for example, with the form. You tell me about the syllables, the rhyme scheme, and then you go with the, to the themes, to the features in the text. You can talk about the, the city life, the, uh, the countryside. You can talk about the politics, how politics became part of, of literature. Uh, you can talk about the puns. You can talk about the similes. You can talk about the, um, the metaphors, everything you have. And then you might say your own opinion just in, in three or uh, like every one of, of these um, points. You can just talk about it in one sentence and you will have three or four lines. And that's it. This is contextualizing. If you contextualize Loveless, uh, this to Lucasta, you can talk about, um, uh, again, the form. First, uh, what's the poem? Who's the writer? Then you can talk about the form, the rhyme scheme. The, you know, here you can see how we have a, a very long line and then a short one, a long one, and then a short one. Uh, the rhyme scheme, the, maybe the music if you want to, if you find it, the alliteration, if you want the alliteration, uh, the pun in the word arms, the, uh, the women in, in, in the poetry, the politics, how uh, personal and the public are connected, are contrasted. You know, again, so this is contextualizing. So you talk about the, po uh, the, the poem, the text, but in its context, in its uh, context. You talk about the form, the, the, the themes, and you, you tell us how these things, how these features are related to the context. If it is um, uh, Commonwealth, how is this related to politics? If it is metaphysical, how is this com um, uh, connected to, to religion and to breaking the rules, if it is, etc. Okay, you get the idea. This is, and today, uh, the discussion for this uh, lecture is to contextualize um, one of these three texts. Just pick one, any one, and contextualize it in, in three or four lines. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and uh, see you, inshallah, next week.